Good morning, everybody. It is my distinct pleasure to help host this fireside chat today. We've uh, clearly been spending a lot of time talking about AI. You know, where is it going? What's the future? How do we get here? What's next? And uh, my guest this morning is somebody who has been living in that world for a very long time and needs very little introduction. Please give a warm round of applause to welcome the former CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt. Hi, Arsalan. How are you? Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Thanks for coming. I'll be honest, I've been at uh, Databricks for 10 years now, and uh, my parents were the most excited then that this morning, they're like, they didn't care about anything else, you'll be on stage with Eric Schmidt. I was like, yes. Well, you know, I was here before. <laughs> I was here 30 years ago on this stage, and I introduced Java right here. Well, so. Quite an accomplishment. Do, do the math. <laughs> <laughs> so. There's obviously a lot of directions uh, that we can go into. I'm pretty sure I'm going to get yelled at to get off stage before we can get through everything. But you know, one of the topics that everybody's interested in is just the speed and fervor which things have come on the generative AI side. And you've been living in that world for a while now. So curious to just hear your perspective. Why now? What's led to this kind of interest and drive? Well, what's the value of inventing a new kind of intelligence? probably pretty high. Um, what's the value of improving every single business process, communications process, entertainment process, educational process in the world? Pretty high. How big? Um, I did a report for the US government which said it was a $40 trillion business. That's big enough to get everyone to play. And the other thing that's interesting is our industry, when I started, which was almost 50 years ago, we were not very good at talking about ourselves. We were actual nerds. We were not actually nerds with shine, if you will. And the industry has changed, and we've gotten really capable of hyping ourselves to the max, right? And I can give you the data of adoption, look at the rate at which ChatGPT was adopted versus Gmail as a simple metric. But the fact of the matter is, it's both better hype better excitement and compression of time. One way to understand this is that before the internet existed, your company, you actually had to sell. You had to call on doors and send CDs and so forth and so on. And the internet created, for, at least for digital goods, an immediate instant success history, which is now what's driving this. There's this sense that you can go completely nonlinear yeah. with something successful. The other problem is that the compression of time means you have almost no time to get it right. And small differences in timing can have huge statistical outcomes based on when you started and when you got there, which is why everyone is in such a rush to get funded, to get people, and so forth. Everybody kind of understands, do it right now. Yeah. OK. So there's a, there's a little bit of that. Now, it's very interesting. Somehow, you know, generative AI all of a sudden has become all about the model. Everybody talks about the model. And um, this big question, we get asked a ton about it from customers. It's been a, a topic where um, I think it's fair to say for many, generative AI became synonymous when chat GPT and open AI came out. And so uh, there's this debate. Is the world going towards this part where there'll just be a small handful of these large foundational models? Or is it going to be more towards whether it's open or specialized models at a balance? Um, we get asked a ton. Obviously, uh, you know, I've seen you talk about it. How do you think about what the future is, the need of the different kind of types of models and how they'll be leveraged? So about a month ago, a number of us wrote a blog post which tried to answer this question. Yeah. And the answer, of course, in tech is both. Um, you're both going to see these incredibly powerful, very, very flexible, what we call frontier models. And they're going to get used in business processes. But you're also going to see incredibly powerful specialized models. Both will happen for different reasons. If you think about it as a business, so one of you is trying to build a, a company that uses advertising, 
but you have an idea to generate the ads for the customers instead of making the customers generate the ads. That's a good idea, and by the way, Google has just now announced they're gonna do that. Good job. Um, so you do that. Do you really want a fully functional learning, changing, and so forth, powerful general purpose model? Or will you be better off served with a specialized model that does a better and better job? And I think in that case, you would want the latter. If the questions are more open-ended, you're probably gonna want the, the more general model. Since we haven't proven the business models of either of these, right, we literally don't know exactly how they're gonna get monetized yet, which by the way is a testament to the world's financial system, that we could raise billions of dollars without having a product plan, a revenue plan, a product price, and an identified customer, thank God for the financial system. And, right, we're all here because of that. So, so I think you're gonna see both. Um, and one of the most interesting questions is the rate of diffusion from the frontier models to the open source models. So if you take a look, GPT-3 is now, the functionality is largely available in the equivalent of Alpaca. Um, that's roughly two to three years in terms of diffusion mm -hmm. from a very expensive, very powerful model to something which is generally available and effectively free. Yeah. And I think the question becomes as we keep getting more and more powerful, at what point is it good enough like for the, for the different uses? Well, the, the, the correct answer is it's never good enough in software, yeah. right? We still, we, we have the M1, the M2, the M3, the M4, we have five nanometers, five, three nanometers, yeah. two nanometers. It's never good enough, but somehow we find a way to use up all of the, the software. Uh, it's the old rule, you all probably don't remember this, it was uh, Grove giveth and Gates taketh away, <laughs> right, was the saying, that Intel would add CPU, yeah. And Microsoft would immediately use all the, so all the hardware for the software that they were building on top. This was you know, 30 years ago, it's yeah. still true. Okay. Um, so we were talking about this you know, briefly backstage. There's a lot about the models and we spent talking about the specialized models and all that. Um, in this world, how do you think about the importance about things such as like data and governance and data quality in terms of driving improvements and effectiveness in the use cases well, around AI. What's interesting is if you look across the fields uh, that are using AI, people, people talk about the algorithms. So if you think about it, you need, what do you need? You need hardware, you need scientists, you need programmers who can build scalable systems, which is not the same thing as scientists, and you need lots and lots of data. In many fields, the most interesting data is data that is being synth synthesized, right? So for example, if you have a physics model and you can act, you know the physics, because the physics, you know, physicists are always right in, in, my, in my world. They can essentially simulate and therefore generate the data that's needed for training. Yeah. There are plenty of other examples where people will do um, essentially sampling of the data. So they'll, for example, sample a series of, of questions and answers, and then they will perturb and generalize those for training. All of these tell you that data is the key and in it's important that the data be curated. You, uh, I wish that you could just sort of run these things over every piece of data regardless of structure and so forth. And I think this is sort of wh why you guys founded Databricks is you were trying to do this, yeah. right? And you've done it super well. So you're one of the components. You need to also be helping people hire the right technical people, get the hardware and so forth to make it complete. Got it. And so in the role of that, you, you basically just touched upon it of uh, data. Right now, the other aspect you talk about, how important will human feedback be in looping that in in order to basically make sure that the models are improving and AI is successful ultimately overall? Well, RLHF um, is a really cool idea. When I first heard it, I figured it wouldn't work, but it turns out it works really, really well. And there are now um, newer, new techniques which allow RLHF plus LoRa, low, uh, basically quick adaptations of the model. Mm -hmm which allow you to fine tune using relatively standardized uh, open source packages that are available on GitHub and so forth. So that has led to this enormous explosion of variance. And so the most likely scenario, in my opinion, we'll see, is you're gonna get a pre-trained model that's quite good a base model. Yeah. And then you're gonna see every conceivable combination in the pipeline, right, RLHF, various other things, synthetic data, synthetic training, evaluation, and so forth to get there. Yeah. The next thing that happens after that is the ability for these models to call to some reference point. 
some ground truth source. And there are startups that are working on calling when it gets confused, which they always do, calling out of the model into something to get a reference point and then put it back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, maybe, maybe switching gears a little bit slightly from that, we've been talking a lot about the potential, the opportunities for AI. Uh, there's definitely a lot around there. I don't know if fear is the right word, but uncertainty of where it's going, and that kind of coincides with discussions about regulation and what's regulation going to be, how things are going. Um, how do you see, you know, do you see us broadly getting alignment on how to regulate AI and the path forward, or at least the challenges that are there, categorizing those and what we should be, how we should be thinking about those going forward? Well, it's interesting that every single politician that I speak with, every single leader I talk to, is now an expert in AI, and they know nothing about what you all are doing. <laughs> so maybe that's always been true, but it's sort of alarming to me. And so the first thing I always tell them is, um, do you remember that movie where the robot gets out and then the female scientist slays the robot at the end of the movie? That's a movie, <laughs> okay? That's not, we're not building killer robots yet, right? Yeah. And that usually sort of disarms them. So when you talk within the technical people within the industry, who are, I think, the only people who really understand what's going on, there's a consensus around three reasonably clear short-term threats that are important. The first one is the one around misinformation and disinformation, and we can talk a lot. Everyone understands what that is, and everyone understands it. Furthermore, generative AI is going to be used enormously for that kind of stuff, so we've got to talk about that. The second thing is the ability for these systems to do various forms of cyber attack and the ability for these systems to do various forms of bio, uh, ba basically bio threats of one kind or another. And the consensus is that today, uh, so first place, AI alignment is a term where how do we get these AI systems to follow human values? AI safety means what are the guardrails that we put on these systems? If you look, for example, at GPT-4, uh, OpenAI spent about six months, they had a whole team who basically using RLHF and other techniques mm -hmm. constrained the model. Yeah. And th those constraints apply both at the API level as well as at their app level. So people kind of understand that model and, the, and the, the, there's always this question of how do, you, how do you test for safety issues that you don't know yet without deploying them? So there's a general fear that these systems, when they're, when they're launched, will not be fully tested because they'll have some emergent behavior that we have not yet seen and therefore we can't test them. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is that um, because of synthetic biology and so forth, um, it's likely that these systems can accelerate at scale evil people. And so if you sit down with Google long enough and you understand enough about biology, you can probably get to a bad pathogen these systems make that somewhat more likely. So we have to sort of think about that. Yeah. So the governments around the world all have variants of pro approaches to this, but the simplest way to frame it is there are scenarios of extreme risk, and these systems are going to get regulated around extreme risk. I'm not talking about the things we always complain about, about you know, uh, you know uh, Johnny, Johnny's dog ate you know, Susie's homework kind of thing. I'm talking about thousands and thousands of people harmed and killed from something. Yeah. So, uh, you know, maybe one or two more questions for me because I know we'll, we'll run out of time, but it always happens. We've, uh, I don't, I don't want to call them kind of uh, hype cycles, but whenever we get these technology there, it, it seems like we go through transformational technology. There's some fear. There's some people who fear it. There's some people who believe that tomorrow, all of a sudden, we don't need programmers anymore because generative AI is going to take up. Neither of the two actually come to fruition. Um, what's your sense of the timeline for when we will start seeing very, very meaningful, we're already seeing some of it, but like kind of almost crossing the chasm, meaningful adoption and leveraging of generative AI like kind of across all enterprises and spaces? So, so the first use of generative AI is already with us, which is programming. And the first and most obvious use is in ex enhancing the power of programmers. And this shouldn't surprise you because every generation that I've been through, the technology was first used by its inventors to make them more productive. Yep. By the way, I'm old enough, this is what email was invited, invented for, right? This is what we used Unix for way back when. We used it to make ourselves more productive. And I used to tell people inside the various companies that I ran that 
why don't you start by making yourselves happy, which is really hard, and then why don't you make your friends happy, and then come back to me, right? That sort of works. Mm -hmm. And we sort of forgot that. We decided that we could build arbitrary consumer products without actually using them ourselves, and that's a mistake. So I think the first use is programming. The gains in programming are profound, and it looks to me like half of programming can be, sort of think of it as a doubling of productivity, right? And that's gonna, that's gonna continue. There's a whole bunch of startups that have even more sophisticated ideas around that. I think that's the first one. I think the second one is going to be in doing things which are in the normal course of business. As I earlier mentioned this notion about uh, advertising, why, again, why do I have to design and argue through my tweet? Why can't the computer ask me what I want to talk about and generate a tweet that is guaranteed by its metrics to be the most viral, right? So if, if I'm trying as a marketeer to have the biggest impact, surely the computer working with me can help me make it happen. Yeah. So I think that all, all of these systems where the, compu the human is doing something, that is against some goal that's administered by computers is probably the next one. It makes yeah. perfect sense to integrate that. Makes sense. Right, we know what virality is, because <laughs> this is what we do all day, whereas <laughs> we do it 24 hours a day and you're sleeping. Yeah. So we'll tell you how to do it. And, and again, that's an improvement in efficiency, if yeah. not quality. And then the next things are these more specialized markets. We don't yet know what the value of intelligence is. We don't know how to price it, but it's obviously high. I like, I like that set of uh, categorization, and we see something similar in terms of the use yeah. cases people are adopting. Now, one of the big barriers right now as people think about you know, LLMs and building them and using them has just been cost. Cost is a huge barrier. It's what, you know, the cost to train them, access to GPUs, it's no secrets why you know, NVIDIA is now a trillion dollar company. Um, you know, I'm just curious, how do you think that barrier of cost, both for training, for inference, for access, for infrastructure, you know, and access to the models coming down over time to make them more accessible. Well, it's, it's interesting that the, in, that the training cost is extremely high and going up by orders of magnitude. There are people who believe that the frontier models, which cost on the order of $100 million to train, yep. plus or minus, will go to a billion dollars to train one of these things. So that is a massive change from a software perspective. In my career, we've never seen that kind of price increase to do software, which is what they are. Yeah. On the other hand, inference, that is the, the ability to actually answer the question, looks like it's going to become trivially expensive. In other words, incredibly inexpensive. And so you end up in a situation where you train one of these models and your biggest problem is making sure it doesn't get stolen, <laughs> right? You spent a billion dollars for these weights, yeah. right, which can basically be put on the equivalent of a hard drive you need to make sure they don't get stolen and used by your competitor or, yeah. or, or whatever. And so my guess is that it, right now you have NVIDIA leading, it's, it's a sore point for me because at Google we have this whole TPU strategy, but 95% of the, of the training is being done on NVIDIA A100s and now H100s. Um, and NVIDIA has recently talked about a successor next year, uh, which they cleverly call H100 Next, um, which sure looks like it's another acceleration in power. Yeah. So what NVIDIA did particularly well is they worked on what is called the FP8 cluster, where basically it's 8-bit uh, floating point multipliers very quickly, mm -hmm. and they put a special module in that that helped them. And now they, in the H100, they have an integrated memory architecture that's stronger. One way to understand that is that the, the way this training works is you have this very large amount of data that's larger than you can put on, on a computer. It's essentially in the network, on the, in the data center. And the algorithm is going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth for hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. Anything you can do to decrease network latency, bring the memory closer, is a huge speed up. We're still in the phase where these computer architectures are evolving faster than I've ever seen. Much faster than Moore's Law, much faster than I saw CPU architectures because of this unique nature of these LLM architectures. Yeah. And that's gonna continue for a couple more generations. Okay. Um, we're about out of time. One last question. You know, you've got tons of enterprises uh, sitting in the audience here. If there was one key piece of advice you could give them of this is what you need to think about in order to be successful, successful in harnessing the power of generative AI, what would that be? Well, the small companies are run by people who are here because you understand that this is core to your business. So a simple rule for a small business 
is you're not going to be successful unless you use AI in your model. And a simple, a simple way of thinking of your business is you have an Android or an iPhone. By the way, Android is more popular than the iPhone, just for data. And you have a network, and then you have a fast, you have a server, typically in the cloud somewhere, which is using AI in your business. Yeah. So think of it that way. Um, you understand all of that. For larger corporations, and I talked to lots of the leaders of those, what I tell them is the following. You don't know what you're doing yet in this space. I say this in a nicer way. You don't know what you're doing in this space, so, and your team may not either. So give them the following assignment. For every business unit you have, come back and show me a prioritized list of what you can do with generative AI. All right, just show me the list, right? And get them all together. And most companies that have done this will come up with 400 or 500 ideas, some of which are customer service, some of which are revenue enhancing, some of which are security, right? And they'll come back. And then the CEO says, holy crap, right? Look at all this stuff that I should be doing. Yeah. And then they realize they have no people to build it. And then they have a crisis. Awesome. Well, Eric, I'm pretty sure I speak for everybody here. It says thank you so much for oh, making the you. time for this. It was amazing. Congratulations to, to you guys, and congratulations for everybody. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Arsalan. Thanks, Thanks again. Thank you. Appreciate you. it. Cheers. Thank you. OK. So one last announcement for folks. Uh, this wraps up, you know, basically today's day of keynotes, a bunch of interesting, really interesting breakouts. Save the date. Data and AI Summit, basically 2024. We'll be back here at Moscone, June 10th to 13th. As far as I know, we're the only conference scheduled that week. If that changes, don't look at me. It's not on us, right? <laughs> Take care, everybody. Cheers. <laughs>